So we're going to be going through Nehemiah chapter 12. Okay, if you've got your Bibles there, turn to Nehemiah 12, verse 1. Um, we're not going to do the recap here. It's kind of in the teaching. So we'll just kind of go through that. We're going to jump right in. Um, these first 26 verses, I won't uh, bore you again. Like I've done this a few times in Nehemiah because they, they, they document the people that are uh, involved in each of these steps, which is really cool if you think about it. You know, you kind of go, why would they put all these names in there? Well, guys, don't forget, the Bible is, is not just a story, like a fun little kid's story that you pull off the shelf and read it before bed. The Bible is a also a historical document, right? It is, it is people and places and things that, have, that people existed, places that you can go to still and events that happened and is documented outside the Bible. And so these names, the Jew, these Jews were putting this down as a historical document. Uh, chrono, uh, um, what do you call it? Uh, chronicle, they're chronicles of, of events and people that, and they're, they're chronicling <laughs> these, these things and, and cataloging them so for the future, which is pretty cool. You know, if you think about it. And so uh, these first 26 verses, for example, um, you, you know, you're, you're getting a whole background here of all these different people. It's, it talks about the priests and the Levites who came up with them, right? And it kind of it goes over all of that. So throughout his writings, uh, like I said, Nehemiah is, is detailed in his documenting specific people who were involved in this return to Israel. It's nobles, governors, leaders, temple workers, singers, Levites, priests, and more. Okay, so like I said, it's a historical document. And so in these first 25 verses here, you're more than welcome to read those names on your own. <laughs> um, he shares who was involved specifically in the days of the governor, Zerubbabel. Okay, Zerubbabel was, uh, was the governor of Judea between 538 and 530 B.C., just to kind of give you a, a point, this was before Nehemiah, right? This is this was a chunk of time before, decades before Nehemiah, um, and so about a, a hundred years, um, just about. And so, 538 to 530 BC, uh, he also documents the the ruler of Persia at that time, okay? And so that was Darius the Great. You know, Darius the Great, he was he ruled from 522 BC to 486 BC. And so, well, again, we see, oh, Darius the Persian there in verse 22. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's like, it's, that's, a, that's a person that you can go and you can see archaeological dig sites. And he lived in this area and there's documentation of that. Guys, the Bible is, yes, 100% the word of God. It's also historical document as well. And it lines up so perfectly with it. And it's just so cool to me to really, when you really dig into it. And so when you read your word, know that it is accurate. Accurate. It is divine. It's also accurate in all things. Science is accurate in science. It's so, much, so much good stuff. Okay. So in verse 26 here, so like I said, this is, he's documenting who came during Zerubbabel. Okay. That was when they started rebuilding the temple. If you guys remember, that's when they started rebuilding the temple. They got released from Babylonian captivity. They started rebuilding the temple. Zerubbabel was the governor at that time. And, um, that's, that, that's that in 26, verse 26, let's just jump to there. It says, these, these people lived in the days of Joachim, the son of Yeshua, the son of Josadak, and in the days of Nehemiah, the governor of Ezra, the priest, the scribe. Okay, and then it, it transitions into his time as governor as well. Okay? Next section here, verse 27. This is kind of where we're going to pick it up. Okay? Remember, the, Israel has, how do we get here, right? This, this monumentous occasion. It, was, it truly was monumentous, right? Because even though during the days of Zerubbabel, there was, and, and Ezra, Ezra, of course, comes and he leads some people that were captive to, to you know, start to settle into uh, the, the region there. Um, but it wasn't really happening. The walls were still trashed. The towers were torn down. The gates were burned. The buildings were destroyed. The temple was, was good to go, but the, the Levites really weren't, there, you know, because people weren't bringing their sacrifices. They were kind of fearful. They were living in the countryside, and you know, and who wants to live in a ruined city that's like all trash? They're like going downtown Maryville, and it's like completely destroyed. The buildings are wrecked. It's like, you want to go down to Maryville, you know, downtown? No. <laughs> no, I'm going to go on my porch and have people over for barbecue. <laughs> so that was kind of like this, and it stayed in that state for like, like I said, decades. And so um, Israel has had, so since that point, of course, Nehemiah 
uh, becomes governor of that area, right? He gets commissioned by, he brings it up to the king of Persia at that time, uh, King Artaxerxes. He gets, you know, leave to go and do this. He gets funding for this. They rebuild the wall. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, I'm speeding this thing up here, all the different chapters. He, he gets um, the money and, and he builds the, rebuilds the walls. He rebuilds the towers. He repairs the gates. And uh, this is all amidst conflict and, and, and threats of war, threats of, uh, you know, levying, uh, you know, go, I'm, we're going to go tell King Artaxerxes on you that you're going to you're planning to rebel. So there was like subterfuge in there, like like blackmail, all kinds of stuff was going on. And so, but yet they rebuilt all this stuff, massive construction project. As I've said before, it's two and a half miles of wall, you know, um, eight feet thick, twenty foot high, clearing rubble, repairing stuff. Man, wild! And they did it in 52 days to the point where people, it was so such a miracle that people recognized, like, this is a work of God, right? So Israel had these married, major wins, the restoration of the temple, the reestablishment as an entity, as Israel. Remember, they were captured, and so they, they kind of like, we're our, we have our own people again, like, we're, we're together, we're, we have our own country, we are Israel, you know? Uh, the, like I said, the reconstruction of the walls, the towers, the gates of Jerusalem, the occupying of the land, the law was being read by Ezra, remember, he gets up there, he, he reads the law, and, and now the people, the people that gathered together, they're hungry for the word. Guys, they're hungry for the word. When you come and you're hungry for the word, God meets you in that place. When, you're, when you want that and you're desiring that, he will meet you, right? Draw near to me and I draw near to you. That's it, man. And that was happened. Ezra gets up, the people are gathered, he reads the law from the law, and people uh, responded, right? They were convicted, and they didn't just walk away. Ooh. They go, we need to change our behavior, we need to be obedient. And they did, and they pledged, and they made this covenant, right? And we had our own version of a covenant, acknowledging our sins as a nation. And we, and, and we've, we made that covenant together for those that were here that week, right? And, and it's like we, we make this pledge. And so they, did a, they had this covenant, and they, they entered in and made a covenant before the Lord that they would be obedient to his word. And they had named off specific areas of compromise in their culture. And they pledged to never go there again. And the people were starting to increasingly be intentional to obey God and put into practice their beliefs, to be intentional about it, okay? Not passive. We talked about this last week. You cannot passively follow God. It must be intentional. Every day, what am I doing today? What's my focus today? Am I walking in the Spirit? Am I praying? Am I reading the Word? Am I connected, right? And so that's what was leading up to this, what we're, what we're about to, to see here. That's all the things that were happening over these, these months, most recent months and years, as he backtracks to who was involved in a previous administration. So now was a time of corporate celebration and worship. Now Nehemiah is like, okay, you know what? Let's worship God for what he's done, right? And you really start to try. If you started making a list of all the things that God has done in your life, how can you not praise him? <laughs> he, he's done so much for us. You, want, you could say he's done everything for us. The only thing we've done is made a mess of things, and he cleans us off, and he says, it's okay, come on. I'm gonna, yeah, I'll take that burden, right? Praise God for that, right? So this, now everything's going to be... So again, the, the, the law's read. People are cut to the heart, but then they repent. They're turning to him. They make this covenant, and now it's, it's, it's culminating into praise and worship, right? As they are dedicating their lives to him, as they're worshiping him, they're praising him, right? And that's kind of... Uh, they're worshiping him for who he is, what he has done. They've seen it with their eyes. Church, may you never forget what God... When he shows up, in your life. And he does. Take notice, by the way. Never forget it. Write it down. May it always be on the front of your mind. Because God is good. He never stopped being good. Okay, look at verse 27. It says, Now at the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem. So he's like, we're going to dedicate this wall to the Lord. Right? At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, they sought out the Levites in all their places to bring them to Jerusalem to celebrate the dedication with gladness, both with thanksgiving, singing, with cymbals, stringed instruments, and harps. 
And the sons of the singers gathered together from the countryside around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netophathites, from the house of Gilgal, and from the fields of Geba and Asmaveth. For the singers had built themselves villages all around Jerusalem. So the, 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 the call went out, hey guys, we're going to have a party. We're going to celebrate, man. And we're not just partying to party and have a good time. We are going to fix our eyes on Jesus and give him the praise for what he's done. Hasn't he done? He does. He's done a lot. So they're rallying people that, you know, the singers and the Levites, because so, part of the worship is going to be sacrifices, right? Part of the worship is giving, and part of the worship is singing, right? And so they're just, they're like, yeah, let's do this thing. So they're gathering them around from all the area. So, uh, you know, the picture people traveling, like, okay, you go north, I'm going to go west, I'm going to go east, I'm going to go south, and they're traveling. Let's bring everybody here, okay? Uh, verse 30. No, we'll pause for a second. So basically, this was an all-hands-on-deck worship event, right? This was not like a typical Saturday, Sabbath, you know. This was a, we are all going to rally together. It's all hands on deck. We're going to have the Levites. We're going to have the priests. We're going to have the singers. We're going to have the uh, leaders. This, this is mentioned later, by the way, the leaders, and more, right? Everybody's involved. This is a, a corporate event. This is a people group. Could you imagine that? Like, hey, across Blunt County, everybody's gathering in one place, and we're all going to worship the Lord before what he's done in our community. That would be, like, that would be a, a kind of a picture of what it would look like. It's like, whoa, we're going to, hey, we're all meeting, you know, uh, in, the, in the parking lot of Allenwick, and we wouldn't hold it all, right? You know, we'd all, we all meet at Neyland Stadium. How cool would that be, you know? Like, it, it just, but for the worship of Jesus, oh, man, that'd be powerful. But that's kind of what was going on. People like, yeah, let's do it, right? Uh, and it wasn't just hype, because there's hype, too. You know, there's, there's, the, there's the, the fake manufactured hype, right? And it can be fun. It's like cotton candy, Whee! and then it's like, oh, you know, it's over, you know. But true spirit-inspired, God-moved, Holy Spirit-prompted uh, worship and devotion and dedication to God and worship of Him. Oh man, it's a beautiful thing, especially as we're united in this worship, and that's what was going on here. Verse thirty. So I brought the leaders of Judah up on the wall. And appointed two large thanksgiving choirs. One went to the right hand on the wall towards the refuse gate. We'll, we'll pause for just a second. I got a little ahead of myself. Um, notice here on verse 30. The priests and the Levites purified themselves and purified the people gates in the wall. Pause there for a second. I want to draw something out of there. The people recognized, they're getting ready to enter into worship. And they recognized that they need to be purified. They recognized that, you know what? I've got some baggage. Like, I need to cleanse myself, right? I need, I, if I'm gonna, I need to recognize my own impurity if I'm gonna be worshiping the Lord, right? And it was addressed. Obviously, we look, we look to the cross. <laughs> He's paid for our sins fully, and we just we recognize that, you know. That's why Jesus is the object of our affection, right? But they would have these. They would have been having sacrifices. Then, verse thirty is telling us that they would have sacrifices to to cleanse uh, the religious leaders as to start. So it started with leadership. They would offer sacrifices for their sin to cleanse themselves, make sure that they've got a pure heart, pure you know, uh, you know purity and forgiveness and all that stuff. And then they would do it on behalf of the people, the people as a whole. Like I said, thankfully we have the blood of Jesus who takes away sin. Right? That's how, that's how we do it, right? He doesn't just cover our sin. Jesus takes away our sin, past, present, and future. We always forget the future part. <laughs> when we come to Christ, it's easy. Oh, yeah, okay, Lord, I thank you for forgiving me. Okay. And then the, you, then you sin the next day, and you're like, ooh, ooh, uh, he doesn't love me anymore. He already knew you were going to do that. Matter of fact, he knew you were going to do all your sins at, at the time of the cross because all of your sins were future at that from that point in time. <laughs> so don't freak out. You know he knows. He already knew. He's like, yeah, I know. I know you're going to be a knucklehead. I forgave that sin too. I still love you. You know. But Jesus takes away our sins. 
And through his perfect work, we have direct access to God. But that's what was going on. This is the Old Testament now. And so they're doing animal sacrifices, which is what God prescribed to do that. And so they're offering, you just, just kind of picture that, the, that the, um, the bronze altar there, the, the flames, and the br- people bringing in animal sacrifices. And it's kind of weird for our culture, right? We don't really do that, you know. And, but that's, that was normal for them. And they're worshiping. They're worshiping. They're worshiping. They're giving in, their, in this purification aspect. And so... Um, so that's my first point here, is to live a life of dedication, worship, and praise, we need to walk in purity. If we're going to live a life of dedication, worship, and praise, we must walk in purity. We have to. Only Christ makes us pure, by the way. We're not talking about legalism, where you can be made holy through the law. We're getting into that in our discipling, right? In our in our discipling groups, you can't be made perfect by the law. That the law will never make you holy. <laughs> Only Jesus makes you holy. Only God's work makes you holy. It's God's holy presence in us as we've repented of our sins and are born again. Are we now made holy? Not because of anything that we've done. We're not worthy of it. We didn't earn it. It's by the grace of God, right? We know this. But we do need to walk in purity. We see that in Scripture. We know that we have sin. You know, it's we know that it's almost hypocritical. We're out getting wasted the night before, and then Sunday morning comes around. We drag our hungover butt to church built, you know, building, and we're like, oh, struggling. And we, and like and they sing in songs. We we can feel that there's maybe hypocrisy in there. Now I'm not saying that. First off, come as you are. I know I and I speak. You I've shared with you my stories. That was me dragging my hungover butt to church service and sitting in the back. And was, I couldn't sing. I was just weep. I just weep. And I felt so unworthy. Lord, I won't do it again. And then Friday rolled around. Saturday rolled around. And Sunday morning. Oh, until God really got a hold of me. You know? And I turned from that stuff. And that was my game changer, though. That was my point. And I, I knew that I, need, that I wasn't doing what I should be doing. And I fought it. I was fighting against it. I was fighting to surrender it. Yeah, but I still want to have my friends. I still want to have my fun. Church is lame. Church is boring. <laughs> you know, I get it. I get it. If you've, had, if you've had those thoughts, man, I get that. By the way, if church is boring to you, you're doing something wrong. <laughs> You're doing something wrong. You're missing it. And I hope you get it. I want to help you get it, you know. Pray about that, you know. But we need to walk in purity, guys. We have to walk in the grace that comes through the work, his work on the cross. We need to worship him not in disobedience. We're going to worship him, dedicate our life to him, praise him. We need to walk in obedience, purity, walk in purity, walk in obedience, this is a man or woman whose heart is after God. And we're not talking about someone who's perfect. Don't, he, don't he put that into there. I'm not expecting perfection here. God's not expecting perfection. If he was, then we'd all be, you know, in our, in our flesh. Now, through him, we are made perfect, which is kind of bizarre when you start to think about that. But positionally, we're good. But when we walk, if our heart is after God, if this, is a, this is a man and woman who recognizes their sin, confesses their sin, repents of their sin, receives God's grace, and doesn't go back to it. Now, do we make mistakes? Yes, but I'm talking about we don't walk in sin. We're not having a regular walk, habitual sin or perpetual. We're all going to mess up, but we don't identify with that. That's not our character. We have a new character, right? We're turning from that. And if you find yourself chained again and it has become habitual, it has become just a regular thing for you, repent. It's, it's the same process. Father, forgive me. I'm so sorry. Help me to not do that anymore. And you crucify your flesh, the Bible says, because it's our flesh. That's walking according to the flesh. You repent of that. You turn to him. You confess to him. Lord, empower me to walk the new life. And he does. He's so good about that, right? That's a, that's, that's a hallmark of a life of dedication, worship, and praise. It's a person who's engaged in the battle to do that walk in purity. A lot of our Western church has become lackadaisical to this. And they go, yeah, well, ah, oh, well. God understands. Well, he does and he doesn't. I mean, he understands you're a dirty, rotten sinner. But, he, but you've got to imagine that God's going... Hey, 
<laughs> what are you doing? <laughs> you know, come on. You see, uh, you can't with uh, out, of, out of your mouth, you can't utter praises. And then on a different night, any other day, you're, you're offering profanity. You know, you're, you're shouting worship songs on a Sunday morning, but you're, you know, carousing and hanging out with the wrong crew, telling dirty jokes or whatever. It's like, dude, <laughs> Jesus talked about that. He's like, you know, that a stream doesn't produce good water and bad water, right? It's like, it's, it's one of the, it'd be, I got, Jesus said, I wish that you were hot or cold, <laughs> right? I think, talking about the, the church, and I think it was Laodicea, right, from in Revelation. Do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, yeah. We need the the key. The key to, by the way, and this thanks thanks kids for bringing that up. So the the I'll, I'll paraphrase. I'm gonna use what you said there, paraphrasing it. Again, walking in purity is not in your own strength. You can't you 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 can't walk in purity. But if you're walking in the spirit, you will. If you fix your eyes not on your past and your bad stuff, fix your eyes on Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. He's the person we look towards, right? We don't we don't want to look towards bad examples or your your junk. Let's look towards what's positive. I've mentioned this before, but and I took a defensive riding course uh, on a motorcycle, right? And so so uh I'm, I'm, the, the instructors were t teaching us in the classroom. He's like, if you see something, an object in the road or a pothole or something, he goes, don't look at the pothole. He goes, you stare at the pothole, you're going to hit the pothole. He goes, you look to where you want to go. He goes, look to where it's clear, and you'll go towards what is clear. It's very similar. Don't look towards the, the pothole. Look towards Christ. Right? Don't look towards your junk, towards your sin, towards your fears or doubts. Look towards Jesus. King David, by the way, walk, talk about walking in purity, right? King David, what was one of the quotes of, of, of regarding his heart? He's a man after God's own heart. Wouldn't that be, wouldn't that be amazing if that was said about you? In the Bible 2.0 or something? <laughs> man, she was a woman after God's own heart, man. You know, that was a man who just, oh, just really wanted more of Jesus. Wouldn't that be cool? That was said about David. King David, king of Israel, right? Second king of Israel, man after God's own heart, wrote over 70 songs. Over 70 songs were written by King David. You know this, right? We read the book of Psalms. Those are songs. We forget that they're songs. <laughs> Somebody read them, we bring the doctrine out of them and stuff like that, but it, you know, which you kind of have to be careful of and some of that stuff. But they're songs, and there was, a, there was music with them, and people would sing to them. Maybe they rapped to them. I don't know. <laughs> he wrote over 70 songs in the book of Psalms, and yet, what do we know about him? He struggled at times, didn't he? He struggled at times, right? He had great victories, though, didn't he? Like that middle picture? Goliath, whoa, epic. All of Israel's cowering. And he's like, why are we letting this person defame God like this? Take a stand. Everybody's afraid. He's like, I'll do it. And he charges in. He says, I come at you in the name of the Lord. Oh. A stone. A stone. What? Crazy. Cuts his head off with the sword. Takes the guy's sword, cuts it off, and holds it up, which is pretty epic. If he's reading, oh, geez, the Bible. Yeah, I know, but it's, it's kind of wild, right? A man after God's own art. Wrote, it, wrote the songs, right? But then he also was a guy who saw Bathsheba and he wanted, he wanted that, even though he's married, even though she's married. Man after God's own heart. What was the difference? He was, it was that he repented of his sin. He, he hid the Bathsheba thing for a little bit, didn't he, though? <laughs> Until Nathan called him out. God's good. God's good. God loves you so much. He will have someone. If you won't repent, he'll bring somebody else to talk to you about it. And that's the, your crossroads. Are you going to reject that person? 
which is really rejecting God. They're just a, they're just a messenger. Or are you going to soften yourself and receive it? Right? The man or woman, after God's own heart, receives the correction, receives the biblical correction, receives the loving biblical correction. Right? Uh, we could say that. But um, the key with David is that he recognized his sin and he repented of his sin and he placed himself at the feet of Jesus and said, Lord, have mercy. Right? He said, have mercy, Lord. He, that's, that's how he was a man after God's own heart. And that's what gives me hope as a, as a man, too, like a fallen person, right? We're fallen, and we can have hope. It's like, how am I going to walk in purity? I can't, even, I can't even go a day you know, without a wrong thought popping in there or a little something coming out. What, how am I going to do? God sees you through his son. And he knows your heart. And he knows your mind. And when you come before him and you just, when you screw up, you come back to him, just be soft towards him. He's like, there you go. There you go, son. There you go, daughter. Come on. All right, let's read on. Verse 31. So I brought the leaders of Judah up to the wall. Okay, up on the wall. I appointed two large Thanksgiving choirs. One went uh, to the right hand on the wall towards the refuse gate. I think I've got a thing. Oh, it's small, huh? Well, take a picture and, take a picture and zoom in on your camera. But he's, uh, he's, he's, he's describing right here. So he's, he's facing north, okay? And he's going to be, because um, this, this says dung gate. That's the re it's also refuse gate, okay? So he's basically uh, you know, standing up in this area. And he's like, okay, some went around this way and some went up around this way. And you're going to see that it goes all the way up to uh, right about there where, where that cursor is, okay? Um, the, the, where the, I think it goes up to the water gate here. And that's going to go all the way to the top, like where it says f uh, fish gate up there. Muster gate. No, it is muster gate. So it's got, basically the, the choir is going to be wrapping around like a two-mile stretch. And so I've, just, I've got it up there. That's, that's the walled city of Jerusalem, by the way. So... Um, Let's, let's dig in, though. So he's, you'll kind of just picture, like, he's directing them to go up onto the wall and spread out. <laughs> and they've all got different, some of them have music, some of them are just singers. This is, this is, remember, they're gathering together. Guys, we need to celebrate and dedicate this wall in the name of Jesus. We're going to shout our praises out, man. It's going to be so cool. And everybody's excited and the energy's going. And, and you can imagine, like, thousands of people are, like, lining up on these walls. Whoa, it's cool. All right, let's read on. After them went... All these people. Okay. <laughs> uh, and then by the fountain gate, verse 37. Okay. Uh, you even see that, by the way, right before that, in 36, it talks about um, these brothers, uh, Shemaiah, Azarel, Malali, all these people. They came with musical instruments of David, the man of God. And Ezra, the scribe, went before them. So everybody's involved, guys. Picture the, the musical instruments. By the way, real quick, these are the musical instruments that, that would be used at that time. So you, you would have the, the psaltery there in the upper left-hand corner. Um, is that what that is, psaltery? Yeah. Uh, tambourine to the right of that. You've got the, when it says trumpet, we think like, you know, what I used to play in, in high school. Well, you probably don't think of what I used to play. <laughs> I used to play trumpet in high school and college. Anyway, uh, but it's not that, right? They didn't, they didn't have that. They, they're, 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 they're the shofars. And so they're trumpets, and so like, burr, burr, you know, it's kind of cool, right? So it's a ram's horn or something like that. And then you have the uh, lyre, which is what David typically played instrument music on. We looks like very much like a harp, right? But it, it's different than a harp. But um, but you can just just kind of picture these, the people are walking up with these instruments and stuff like that, and they're you know they're getting they're tuning them probably, you know, getting set up. So that's what was going on there, uh, and as, as they're as they're moving around Jerusalem, okay. And so it says, verse thirty-seven, by the fountain gate in front of them, they went up the stairs to the city of David on the stairway of the wall beyond the house of David, as far as the water gate eastwards, and that was the water gate that I was talking about right there. Um, and so. Uh, verse 38, the other Thanksgiving choir went the opposite way, and I was behind them with half of the people on the wall, going past the tower of the ovens, as far as the broad wall. He's just kind of working away north. Uh, and, uh, and above the gate of Ephraim, above the old gate. Some of these gates have different names, by the way. They have like, they go by different names, stuff like that. It's like you've got 321, the Highway 321, which is also known as 
Lamar Alexander, right? So like, which, you know, it's, it's, it's something like that. Hey, what about uh, William Blunt? Uh, well, that's 335, right? So it's kind of the same type of thing. Okay. So they, call, they went up by the old gate, the fish gate, the tower of Hananel, the tower of the hundred, as far as the sheep gate, and they stopped at the gate of the prison, a.k.a. the muster gate. With muster, not mustard. Uh, and so, <laughs> French's. Anyway, okay, so... Um, so yeah, so th it's it's spread out. Almost the whole wall is is has people lined up on it. You just pic like picture that. Look everywhere you see, you see like the silhouette of people, uh, you know, at the backdrop of the sky. You know, it's wow, this is wild, right? Instruments, singers, people have been gathered together inside the city as well too, right? So it's, it's packed. This place is packed. Where did I leave off? Verse forty. We stop in there? No, keep going. So the, so the two Thanksgiving choirs stood in the house of God. Likewise, I and the half of the rulers with me, the priests, Eliakim, Maaseiah, Benjamin, Micaiah, Elonai, Zechariah, Hananiah, with trumpets. Remember, trumpets. Trumpets. Okay. Um, I've played one of those things. They're pretty cool. <laughs> it sounds really cool. You can hit a couple notes. That's about it. Um, also, Maaseiah, Shemaiah, Eliezer, Uzai, Jehoanan, all these people, they're singers. They sing how? Huh? Loudly. Loudly. They didn't go, Bless the Lord, O oh my soul, O oh my soul. They sang loudly. Because they were, why? We're worshiping the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords. He look what He's done. They're standing on the walls that He empowered them to build, and He protected them from enemies. He's delivered them and into their own promised land, and they've come back. Man, it's been restored, and he, oh, they're just excited for what God has done. Right? The Word has come alive in their hearts, and they've pledged, they've made this covenant to Him, and He's worthy of their worship, and they're crying out loudly. And it wasn't just the singers crying out loudly. It was the people too, I'm sure, right? <laughs> There's no greater sound that I, on, a, on a Sunday that I like more when I can hear you guys singing louder than me. Honestly. When I can hear you above myself, oh man. I love singing with you. By the way, I understand there's times of reflection when you go quiet and you're listening. And you're, okay, I'm not taking away from that. <laughs> All right. Um... Verse 43, and that day they offered great sacrifices. We're talking about animal sacrifices, right? Because they're worship, worshiping, giving, all that stuff. They great, offered great sacrifices and rejoiced, for God had made them rejoice with great joy. The women and children also rejoiced, so that the day of Jerusalem was heard afar off. What? That means like they're here and like, people are on this, you know, the, the, the main highway, and they're like, they're traveling with their goods or whatever, and they're like, is that music? <laughs> you know? <laughs> Son, are you listening to your AirPods back there? <laughs> no, Dad. <laughs> that's oh, coming from over there, right? And they look, at, that's Jerusalem. Jerusalem. Yeah, I heard, that. what is going on, you know? Wow. That's how loud they were, just passionate. Unplugged, by the way. They didn't have amps. They didn't have speakers. <laughs> They just had soul. <laughs> so one choir went one direction, the other choir went the other. It's about 200, I, I, I calculated it roughly, roughly, so don't, if you're going to dig into this and you go, well, actually, it's 1.87 miles. Okay, it's so roughly two, two miles of wall. That's a lot, that's a lot. It's a lot of distance, right? That would take about... That would take about 2,000 singers, musicians, and leaders. Now, they're the people funneled into the city proper, too, inside the walls. Heck, there might have been some people outside the walls, too. I don't know. But people would have funneled in to that main, you know, main area of Jerusalem and all, all the different places, right? But I'm talking about on the walls themselves. It would take about 2,000. That's a worship team right there. <laughs> yeah, I love it. And they're up there with all the instruments of David, which is what I just pictured, right? So, or showed you on, on there. And uh, 2,000 singers, musicians, leaders from the water gate to the prison gate, or also a.k.a. the muster gate. Um, and then musical instruments like, like David, we talked about that. 
So it, it, everybody's set up there. They're sacrificed. There's sounds of rejoicing. It was loud. The, jo- the joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. I, like, I love that. The joy. The joy of Jerusalem. That's a song. There's, I think this might even be a line from a, a, a psalm, actually, which the joy of the Lord is our strength. The joy. And isn't that true? When you've got... I've got the joy, 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 joy down in my heart. Where? Down in my heart, right? Man, oh, it just, you, nobody can, you can't take, they can't take it from you. You can take possessions, you can take, you know, privileges or, or, or freedoms, all this stuff, but you can't take, you can't rob someone's joy because who puts it there? Yeah, it's not happiness. Happiness is based off of your external circumstances. Happiness is, hey, I got the new iPhone. <gasps> Woo! It's so cool. And a day later, you're like, oh, I heard they're going to come with a new one. Moo. <laughs> Moo. Right? Fades so quick, doesn't it? Happiness is so fickle. It's so fickle. I love Tennessee. Man, you team. Get it. Then they lose. You're like, I'm a stupid team. <laughs> I'm unhappy. I'm happy. I'm happy. I'm unhappy. <laughs> Joy from the Lord? Solid. Solid. Because it comes from Him. It's not based on your circumstances. It's not based on your external, you know, things you like. It's based on God being part of your life. So when it comes to a life of dedication, worship, and praise, be bold with your faith. This is what I'm seeing in here. These people were bold. They weren't like, well, what will our neighbors think? Are they going to think we're kind of like, that we're... You know, Yahweh freaks, <laughs> Jesus freaks. Are we? Are we going? Are they going to think? What, what if the enemies hear it and then they want to conquer us because they hurt us? Oh, I don't know. What will my neighbors think? They were bold. They, you know, we're worshiping God. That's what it is. That's what we're doing. You know, be bold with your faith, man. Church, be bold at work with your faith. What if they fire me? Then they fire you. Well, yeah, but you don't understand. I, mean, I, have, I gotta get paid. You don't think God knows that? I'm not encouraging you to get fired, okay? Hear, hear me out. But I'm encouraging you to be bold. Look for a way to interject. Offer prayer. Talk about God. Talk about a church service. I've been fired before for sharing for my faith. Guess what? God gave me a better job. Just saying. Okay? Do your work. Be a good worker. Okay, I'm not saying slack off and talk about Jesus all day. Okay, no. Be an awesome worker. Be an above average, like just like, wow, this person is amazing. Like they just serve so well, which we should. Christians should make the best employees. We should be the most responsible, the most positive, the most joy-filled, the most trustworthy, the most honest, just good, because we work unto the Lord. You guys know this, right? Ephesians talks about this. That whatever you do, do it. I think it's Ephesians. Whatever you do, do it as unto the Lord. That means He's our boss, capital B boss. Okay, you work for Him. You're a garbage man. You're a garbage man for Jesus, man. <laughs> right? You're a corporate guy. You're a corporate guy for Jesus. You're a burger flipper. You're a burger flipper for Jesus. You know. And, and then while you're just an amazing person, now you're, ta- you're, you're building connections with people and you're being bold with your faith at work. You're being bold with your faith with your neighbors. People you're walking around. Are you talking to people? Are you inviting them to church services? Or do you have your, your Bible tracts that are set out there? Do you have those in your pocket or your purse? Are you prepared? Do you have them in your car just in case? Who knows? Maybe. Do you have a Bible that if you pray with somebody and they receive Jesus, you can hand them a Bible? Like, Christian, be, be bold with your faith. Otherwise, what are we doing? It's not about, we talked about this a couple weeks ago, it's not just about you. Sure, you've got your needs, I get that. But your faith, your walk is not just about you, newsflash. It's about Jesus. It's about knowing Christ and making him known. So be bold with your faith. Shake, rock the boat a little bit. It's uncomfortable. Yes. Who said, this, who said anything about following Jesus being comfortable? Oftentimes it's not. It's uncomfortable. The problem is our flesh wants comfort, right? We're not on a cruise ship. We're on a battleship, right? Warship. <laughs> right? So stop. You've you got to catch yourself. you got to catch yourself with that because your, your flesh creeps in there, doesn't it? Well, I'm a little tired to go to service today. 
I think I'll just sleep in. Well, I don't really like this song. I just wish it was blah, blah. Oh, it's just a little bit cold in here. Ah. That's, that's cruise ship thinking. This is not about you. And I know, I, I'm, I've been there. I've been there, guys. This is not cruise ship. It's not the buffet line. Well, I don't like that stuff. I like this. Dude, we're on a battleship. Man, your station. Where were you? We needed you five minutes. What's going on? What you, are you at your post? What the, you know, we're communicating. We're not angry with each other. <laughs> don't mistake me. You know, but we're, it's like there's an earnestness. There's, a, there's, like, there's a, hey, we got to get going. We got to dial this in. We got to do our jobs well. Guys, I study. I study because I want to do my job well. What's my job? My job is not just to give you a warm fuzzy. Okay, my job is to equip you for the work of the ministry. That's my biblical job. I want to equip you with an understanding of the Word of God. That's why we go verse by verse, book by book through the Bible. And I want, yes, I'm here to encourage you. Don't make a mistake. You know, I, you know I pray for you. You know all these things, right? But I, I need to, primary is to equip you. Okay? I'm, 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 I'm here to train you to now be bold with your faith. And as you start to open your mouth, guess what? You're going to get challenged. You're going to get pushed back. And it's going to be uncomfortable because they're going to ask question or give you an argument that you were like, I don't know what to say to that. That's okay. Find the answers. Well, then I got to learn. Isn't reading the Bible enough? Now I got to learn about apologetic stuff and like how to, oh my gosh. That's, that's, that's cruise ship thinking, guys. I just want to kick back. <laughs> Lay on the deck, the sun deck. <laughs> Have someone bring me my margarita, non-alcoholic. <laughs> no, just come on, guys. Get in the game. Okay. To live a life of dedication, worship, and praise, we have to be bold with our faith at work, in our neighborhoods, in our families, be alive, be just dialed in, man. And that's, that's on me too, guys. It's not like I'm a human being just like everybody else, okay? I've got my own struggles. And it's easy to get absorbed in these things. And I know. And I have to fight that. There's a part of me that, that, that wants to veg out. It's a part of me that wants to just take it easy. And there's a time and season for rest. Don't make a mistake on that. Okay? But we only have so much time to live. And none of the stuff that we're amassing for, for ourselves comes with us. None of it. Not a single time is a hearse pulling a U-Haul. Not once. One day we will breathe our last, and the only thing that's eternal, the only thing that comes with us, is the work we did in Jesus' name, through him. So why don't we invest more in the kingdom rather than investing things of the world? We know this. We know this. I'm not saying anything new to you guys. This is nothing new. I'm just bringing it front of mind. Like, yeah, geez, yeah, you're right. So let's, do, let's invest in the kingdom, not our kingdom. His kingdom, not ours. Okay. <laughs> Verse 44. Okay, boom. They've, they've 2,000 plus singers and, and, and musicians have lined the walls. The people have funneled in. The energy is there. It's getting set. Oh, man, it's wild. The joy, well, the songs were so loud. And the people were singing collectively so loud. Husbands, wives, kids, single people, old people, young people alike. Everybody's worshiping. The joy of Jerusalem was heard afar off. And verse 44, at the same time, were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse for their offerings and the first fruits and the tithes to gather them into the fields of the city, the portions specified by the law of the priests and Levites. For Judah rejoiced over the priests and Levites who ministered. Notice what's happening. They're excited and they're giving, right? They're giving. They're making offerings. They're just, just, they're just worship and praise. Both the singers and the gatekeepers kept the charge of their God and the charge of the purification according to the command of David and Solomon his son. Obedience. Verse 46. For in the days of David and Asaph of old, there were chiefs of the singers and songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. In the days of Zerubbabel and in the days of Nehemiah, all Israel gave the portions for the singers and the gatekeepers, a portion for each day. They also consecrated holy things for the Levites, and the Levites consecrated them for the children of Aaron. So they're giving, they're giving tithes, they're giving offerings, they're giving first fruits. Uh, um, these were acts of dedication and worship and praise. It just it came out of an act of worship. That's why we, that's why you know, uh, Matthew's praying 
and, 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 uh, and worshiping in the giving of our tithes. Let's pray over these things. They're an offering to Him out of our hearts, out of our love and adoration for Him. It's in worship. You can give in worship. How cool is it? If you're not giving in worship, just start. Start doing that. <laughs> if you're doing it out of raw obligation, like, switch it up. You know, like, like, let that be an act of worship. Father, I worship you and I give this to you. Man. It ch it'll change your thinking. <clears throat> and it mentions here that these, that, that these things keep happening, right? That sacrifices keep happening and all that stuff. So, so, this, so just note this in verse 45, it talks about that. Um, for the purification, it says, uh, the singers, the gatekeepers kept the charge of their God and the charge of the purification, according to the command. So they're making sure that, because remember, purity is not a once, you know, it, like the walking in purity. Okay, that's, that's an ongoing day-by-day -day choice. It's a moment-by-moment -moment choice. You'll be at a crossroads and, hey, you want to come out here? Da, 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 da. No, I'm not doing that thing. Or you're scrolling through your phone, all of a sudden, bing, there's that ad. Your flesh wants to look at it. No, no, matter of fact, I'm just going to put my phone away. Right? So we, got, we, we, get, we have these crossroads with us. Like, what are we going to do? What are we going to say? What are we going to look at? What are we going to think? What are we going to listen to? All those different things. Purity is not a one-time thing. It's a day-to-day, moment-by-moment thing. And that's kind of what they were talking about there in verse 45, so to speak. Um, um, there's specific tools and instruments of worship that verse 47 talks about that they're setting aside. They're consecrating those holy things for the Levites and the Levites consecrated them. So there's a, a particular way uh, of, of worshiping the Lord. And they were just being obedient. And they were setting these things, uh, 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 they were consecrated or they are set apart for special use. Holy. So they set aside these special instruments. They're bringing them, hey, you need these tools and these tools. Well, Lord, we thank you for these tools. You know, like, I, I praise the Lord for the speakers here and the, and the screen so we can have illustrations and see these images, right? And, and, and thank you, God, for the, the air conditioning and all these different things. We can, we can praise the Lord. We can consecrate those things, this, these tools for holy use, you know? Consecrating their I've prayed when we came in here, you know, I, and, we, and uh, we, I, uh, we prayed over the different rooms. Um, when we added the youth room, we prayed over the over the room, we anointed the room and said, Lord, this is yours, may ministry take place here. I've had people pray over each of the seats and anoint your seats that you're sitting on and just it's just an act of worship and dedication. It's the consecrate. Say, Lord, this is for you. These are your seats. These are this is your place. We we're praying about that this morning. This is your church, Lord. You're the head of the church. We love you. Right? And so like there's this this um this well, here's the here's the point. Um oh, to live a life of dedication worship and praise, we need to be set apart. Our things should be set apart for his use, but we ought to be set apart for holy use. God wants to consecrate you. Isn't that kind of crazy? We are. Through Jesus, we can be set apart for holy use. The Bible talks about this. Many places. So if you're wanting to live a life of dedication, worship, and praise, let him set you apart for holy use. And you're like, wow, what does that look like? Well, it's a matter of spending time in your word, spending time in prayers, being in fellowship, and all those things that you know. But it's all the little things, too. Letting go of this, letting go of that. Freeing yourself up. Having a little bit of more margin in your life for, for in-the-moment stuff, needs that come, ab come about. You know, we had a particular need of someone this morning, and I, I'll be honest, like in my flesh, I'm like, all oh, right, but I got to get in, I got to tune the guitar, we got to get everything turned on, da 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 da. And, and there was somebody that had a need. And I was at a crossroad, like, what am I going to do? I, I, I chose to help, by the way. <laughs> you guys are, yeah, what did you do? Oh, I, I told them no. <laughs> we need to, uh, you know what? I'm set apart for holy use, so if God brings somebody on my path, who's to say that's not the ministry for today? You know, let God set you apart for holy use, man. We're, be the, we're to be set apart in how we dress. We are, as Christians, we are to be set apart in how we dress, how we speak. We are to be set apart as Christians in how we give, on how we love, how we forgive. We should be set apart for that. We're to be set apart in how we vote. Christians should be, should be voting differently, you know, in a, in a very unique way. By the way, ChristianVoterGuide.com. It's a cool tool. ChristianVoterGuide.com. If you haven't voted already, I encourage you to do that. I think it's your duty and you, as, a, as an American citizen to be doing that. I think everybody here should vote. Well, if you're over 18 or older. <laughs> um, 
ChristianVoterGuide.com. It's, it's great. It, it kind of lays out the different candidates, including there's uh, resources on there locally as well. Here's the, the, here's the topic. Here's what each platform is uh, talking about. We're to, be, we're to be set apart in what we look at. Church, we should be set apart in what we listen to, what music we're listening to, what movies we watch. We should be set apart in these things. If a person watched you, hear me on this, just a little exercise here. If a person drew a day at random and watched you for any given 24-hour period, any given Friday, we'll pick Friday, any random Friday, would they see a life of dedication, worship, and praise? Would they see Jesus? If they just watched you, they had a reality TV. Here's a Friday in the life, we'll use me, in the life of Tony. Are they seeing Jesus? Are they seeing a life of dedication, worship, and praise? This is Colossians chapter 3, verse 12 through 17. It says, Therefore, as the elect of God, holy and beloved, put on tender mercies, kindness, humility, meekness, long-suffering, bearing with one another, forgiving one another. If anyone has a complaint against each other, even as Christ forgave you, so you must do. But of all, above all these things, put on what? Love, which is the bond of perfection. And the peace of God... And let the peace of God rule in your hearts, to which also you are called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Right? Right? Do you see the being set apart there? It's our minds, our hearts, our actions, our words, all these different things. Guys, may you, may you grow in that. May you grow in your walk in purity. May you grow in being bold in your faith. And may you grow in being set apart by God. It's not a one and done. This is a lifelong process. Right? It is. It's a lifelong process. The Bible calls it sanctification. It's a big word there, sanctification. It's the process of being made holy. It's the process of learning to walk in purity. It's the process of being bold with your faith. It's the process of being set apart for his use. It's not about you. It's about him. Right? Amen?